we, 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 uh, as far as I'm concerned, finished up the unit on graph algorithms, although we're going to have an interesting daily problem on graph algorithms. And today I want to get us into a new subject, which is backtracking. Um, any questions, first of all, about graph algorithms or anything like that? OK, let me go and do the daily problem for today. Again, last one, go, go. OK, let me do the daily problem, um, and no more after this guy. OK? OK, the daily problem, th today's daily problem, I think, is actually a very interesting one. Um, it says the following. We are given a graph, which is a weighted graph. It's directed, let's say, such that all weights are positive, OK? Let u and v, v and w be two vertices, and k an integer. We want to find an algorithm that will find the shortest path from u to v, or v, uh, v to w, that contains exactly k edges. OK, does everybody kind of see this? I'm specifying how many hops I'm allowed in my graph, OK? And I want to find the, um, OK. And I, and I want to find the, um, what you call it? I want to find uh, the shortest path with that number of hops to it. OK? Any questions about what the problem is asking? Yeah? Am I claiming it's possible? I'm claiming it's certainly possible in that I want to know what is the shortest path from u, from v to w, that contains exactly k edges. It might not be the shortest path over the whole graph. But for any, for, any, um, for any two points in a network and any k, there is a length of the shortest path that uses exactly k edges. OK? And that's what we're asking to find. Any questions? You look surprised. Yeah. Yeah, so the problem here, no, 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 no. OK, the problem is that for any k, and for any graph, we're going to, first of all, does everybody see that in principle such a thing has to exist? Whether we can find it efficiently is a separate question. But let's, his concern is an existential question. I am asking the question, here is a graph. Here is a k. Here is a starting point. Here is an ending point. I want to get from here to here using exactly k edges in the cheapest way possible. That's what it's asking. Now, is it possible that there is no way to get from here to there in k edges? Let's take a look at this. Let's say, um, let's say my graph looked like this. Okay, let's say these are, these are undirected edges. One, two, three. Suppose this is u, this is w, my start and end point. What is the shortest path that gets from here to here What's the length of the shortest path that gets from here to here using three edges? Six. Does everybody see it? What's the length of the shortest path that gets from here to here in exactly four edges? It's infinite. There's no way to do it. What's the shortest path that gets from here to here in exactly five edges? OK, the answer is eight. And why is it? I can go ka-chung, 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 ka-chung. Does everybody see that? OK. It says here explicitly, note that the path does not have to be simple. Simple would mean that you don't repeat any edges or vertices on the trip, on the path. OK. But I'm not requiring that. I'm only requiring that it use exactly k hops, OK, and get from where the start to the end. Any questions? Yes? OK, well, the, 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 there's a length of a shortest path. What's the shortest way to drive between here and London? Well, it's an infinite cost, OK? I mean, you know, that would, be, that would be the way I would define it. It's an infinite cost. If, it doesn't, if, if there is no path of that, with that number of hops, we will say that the cost is infinite, OK? Any questions about that, about what we're trying? Yes? OK, in this case, the graph is directed. So my example was for an undirected graph. But the same basic principle is going to hold, OK? Any questions? 
If I made it directed and having edges going both ways, then it's directed and it, it does what I want, right? Any question? Yes? Um, if, if I don't specify whether the graph is acyclic or not, you have to assume it can have cycles in it, right? There's no reason why, why that should be constrained. OK, any questions about what the problem is now? Then let's think about this a little bit. How do we do it, OK? Um, OK, let's hear some ideas how to do it. Yes, let's try you. OK, I'm hearing recursive. I'm hearing append list and something like that. Any other ideas? The answer is maybe. OK, yeah. Well, maybe we can have a stack. If, if I uh, add the <coughs> place contains all the logic that we can get from three, just one stack, and we, with the short stack, we have a, uh, the, uh, x1, and we have another x2. This contains all the logic that we can get one stack from the x1, but uh, only one stack small. And then we can recursively have OK, what I'm hearing again a little bit, OK, is maybe the following kind of an idea, OK? Any other ideas just before we're thinking about it? Yeah. OK, so there are two things I don't like about that. First, I don't like the way you pronounce Dijkstra, OK? OK, that's, that's one thing, OK? The other thing that, again, that's not it. The other thing that, that is that, that something like that, you're now designing a graph algorithm. You're saying, I'm going to take this thing, I'm going to modify it, and somehow it, there's going to be a correctness argument, OK? And that's something that needs a correctness argument, needs enough precision and a correctness argument to make work. And I'm not sure I know how to do it, OK? But I did hear recursive ideas. And that I do think I know a way to make it, OK? And let's say we let the following idea happen, OK? Let's say I define a um, function that is going to tell me what is the cheapest way to get to vertex v, OK, after i edges, OK? Let's let S sub i is going to be defined as the cost of the shortest path from the source, whatever that, what did I call the source, OK? Let's say I'm going to call it whatever the source vertex is, to v using exactly k uh, i edges. OK? Does everybody believe that if I could compute this magic function, this would do my job for me? Right? How would it do my job for me? I would find what this value was for v equal to whatever my target vertex is, where I want to end up. And this count is exactly k. Does everybody see that? That my destination, comma, k is what I want to do. Now, some of you gave me some ideas. What would be the cost of getting from the source to vertex, to, to, to vertex v using zero edges? Do we know how to do that? What's the cost of getting the v in zero edges? OK, can anybody answer this one? Yeah? Right. If, if v is the same as my source, then I can do that at a cost of 0, right? And else, the cost is going to be infinite. Does everybody kind of agree with that? OK. What is another way to think about it? Let's just try one more. What is s sub v comma 1? OK, if I'm allowed one hop, what would this be? Yeah? 
Well, if it's only allowed, the path is only allowed to be of length one, what is the cost of the path, yeah? It's the allocation. It's the edge, right? This is going to be the weight of the edge, source V, right? OK, if you know that edge exists, right? If you know there is an edge, source comma V. And otherwise, what's the cost going to be? Infinite. Does everybody agree with that? Now, for, 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 to, to, for the big question, what is? S sub V comma K. OK? Is there a way to compute this recursively? Does anybody have an idea how to do it? Yeah? You're saying that this is going to be, I think what you want to say, it is the min, OK? over all vertices x, such that we can get to vertex x after k minus 1 edges, plus the weight of the edge from a x to v. Does this make sense? Think about this. If this makes sense, life's going to be much easier for you in a few weeks. OK? Do people see that this is kind of a recursive algorithm to do what we kind of want it to do? OK. We're going to keep track explicitly of what is the shortest path. OK. What, what is the shortest path using you know, i hops for all i to all vertices? And if we know the shortest path for, k, for the length of, uh, uh, using k minus 1 edges, the shortest path with k edges is going to be the shortest path someplace with k minus 1 edges plus one extra edge. Does everybody see that? And does everybody see that this algorithm does the trick? OK, any questions about that? Yes? Um, is it different than what you suggested? Well, let's think about it. Okay, first of all, first of all, I don't mean nothing personal. OK, so I, I, if I said something bad, I apologize. OK? Now, when I think about Dijkstra, I'm thinking about an algorithm involving cues. I'm involving some notion of parents and going back to certain ways of doing it. This is a little bit of a different, to me, this is a different kind of an idea than a Dijkstra idea. When you try to compare ideas, how does it say it's different? Part of me says that, that, that this, is a, this is a different idea. OK? If you don't think it's a different idea and you understand this, then that's fine. OK? Any questions about it? Yeah? Well, you say, why don't you build, what you might say is build all the paths of length k. How many paths will there be of length k in the worst case in an n vertex graph? Many. Many, but how many? OK. Yeah? Something like the number of, I think it's more like the number of vertices to the power k. Does everybody see that? Whereas, how much is this going to cost us? This, I'm going to argue, is something like the number of vertices times k times at each step we're doing something that takes the num time the number of vertices. This, I claim, is going to run out to be something like n squared times k. OK? How many people see this idea? Any questions about it? Question like I don't see it is a good question. Yeah. Can you read it? Okay, that's a problem. Okay. S of v comma k, the shortest path to vertex k, v using exactly k edges. Okay, is the min of x for some min over all vertices x of the cost of getting to x after k minus one vertices plus the weight of an edge that goes from x to v. OK, does that kind of make sense? The shortest path of length k edges is going to involve the shortest path somewhere with using k minus 1 edges, plus the cost of that last hop, which is covered by here. 
And the vertex that minimizes this overall does the job. OK? Any questions? Yes? If, if the vertex is not connected to V, what's the minimum if I have a bunch of choices? If, let's say, I'm an isolated vertex here, OK? And I'm not connected to anybody. What's the cost of the shortest path uh, using k edges getting to me? Well, we're going to look at every other vertex and say, what's the cost of the cheapest way of getting to it? That we know. Plus the cost of getting to me, that's going to be infinite. It's the min of a bunch of infinite possibilities. The cost is still going to be infinite. Yes? Any questions? OK. Any questions about this idea? OK. Yes? Why does it have collection complexity n squared times k? OK? And it's funny, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but I think now people might get this pretty easily. How many different s thingies are we going to have? OK? One of these different function calls, we'll call that an s thingy. OK? It's got two arguments here, right? There are, the first one is a vertex in the graph. How many possible vertices in the graph are there? N. The other thing is a number between 1 and k. How many choices are there for a number between 1 and k? k. That tells me that there are k times n different s thingies. Does everybody kind of agree with me? OK. Now, how much time does it take to compute an s thingy? Assuming that we have the values of the smaller ones there, right? If this was an array of uh, uh, an n by k array was holding these values, right? Now, to look this value up after we compute it, it's only going to be constant time. To look up this edge weight in the graph is only going to be constant time, right? So what are we going to do? We're going to now try the min to compute this value. We're going to take the min over all vertices from 1 to n, right? So how much time does it take to compute one of these things? To compute one of these things, v, k, for a specific v and a specific k, how much time does it take to compute it? I heard someone say it, but I want to hear more people say it. How much time would it take to compute it? For a specific value of v and a specific value of k, how much time will it take to fill that in? n, because you've got a loop that's going from i goes from 1 to n, right? And then looking this guy up from an array, and then looking that thing up from an array, right? So the answer is, why is it n squared times k? It's because it's kn boxes to fill, and each box is going to take at most order n time to fill. OK? Any questions about that? Any questions about that? OK? Think about that. If you've got that, that's going to be a very good thing to know. OK? So, so keep, if you don't got it, a question is a good, reasonable answer. Yes? Why is it constant time to do this? Well, suppose we are computing these things. Once we have s of v of 1 sitting here, how much time is it going to take to compute it for s of v of 2? OK, if, we have an, if this stuff is stored in an array, a two-dimensional array that goes from 1 to n and 1 to k, right? If we stored these values in our array, now, when we want to compute for v of 2, where are we going to get the value of x of 1 from? Hasn't that already been computed? And isn't that sitting in an array for us just to read? So we will have, when we compute number 2, we will have the values for number 1. And then we will compute it for the values of number of 3, knowing that we have the values for k of 2 there. Does everybody see that? This is a, cl a clever way to evaluate this, recu th this recurrence, OK? But if we evaluate it kind of from bottom up, 
The values we need are sitting there, and we can just look them up. Okay? Any questions about that? Yes? Well, we know, you, do you agree we know the value for zero? Yeah. Do you agree we know the, the value for one? Tells you that, yes, that's the edges of the graph, right? So darn right we know the values for one, right? Now to compute the values for two, do we need any other values other than one? Right? To compute the value for V2, we need the values for two, v, x of 2 minus 1, or 1. So we already have that, right? So there's no cheating involved in doing it. We could fill in the values for 2 now, right? Do you agree? We have everything we now need to fill in the values for k equals 2. Do you agree? Now, once we have the values for k equals 2, do we have the values we need to fill it in for k equals 3? Then for 3, 3 minus n is 2. We have the ones for 2. Does everybody see that if we fill these things from the bottom up, we have what we need when we need it? OK? Think about this, OK? We'll go through this again later when we talk about dynamic programming. But think about this, OK? And if you actually see it, you see what's really the, what's really the guts of what we're going to be doing when we talk to dynamic programming. Any questions? Yes? So why is the of What is that? Say that again. So the because based on that, it's in the total set k, not why is it k times n? Why is it k times n? How many different boxes? Each box in the array, this is a two-dimensional array where the vertices can, argument can go from 1 to n, and the k argument can go from 1 to k. Does everybody see that? So that's why there's k times n boxes. And if I fill these boxes in cleverly from bottom up, each box can be filled in order n time. OK? Any questions about this? OK? This is cool. You'll get another chance to think about these kind of things. But if you kind of follow this, keep that in your head and be inspired by it, because that's, that's, that's the crux of the idea we're going to spend in dynamic programming. Any questions? Let me tell you one other thing. Again, I am apologizing again to, to, to my Dijkstra person here, OK? But let me tell you why I, I don't like the idea of, oh, I'm going to take Dijkstra and modify it. OK? Because again, this is something that, to me, I have a hard time thinking through proofs of things. What did I tell you about graph algorithms? OK? I am terrified to design any kind of a graph algorithm. OK? And the reason is because correctness issues are often very, very subtle. So often when I give this, you know, give this thing, and somebody says, oh, I'll do it BFS, but I'll do it in this way, and it's going to be fine. OK? I'm, I'm terrified of designing new graph algorithms. What I like to do, and this, this I'm going to argue hardly is a new graph algorithm. It almost doesn't look like a graph algorithm. Is there a way I could have used Dijkstra's algorithm unwashed to solve this problem? OK? Remember, I like to think about, um, sometimes I think it's a lot easier and cleaner to design a new graph rather than to design a new algorithm. Is there a way I could have designed a graph such that the shortest path from one vertex to another would be exactly the shortest path of k nodes in it, of, of, of k edges? Any ideas how you could build such a graph? Let me give you an idea uh, and see if this kind of makes sense. Let's say I am going to draw in space K sheets of picture K sheets of paper in space, floating around in space. Actually, I guess K minus K plus one sheets of paper. Each of which has the vertices of my graph drawn. Does everybody see that for all these papers? They could have probably should have Xeroxed the, the vertices before I put the had these papers hanging in space. Does everybody kind of see this thing? 
Now, what if I add, if there was an edge from, if there was an edge, if this is vertex 1, 2, 3, and 4, if there was an edge from 1 to 4, OK, I am going to not draw it on the same sheet of paper. I'm going to draw it in the space between these things and make it directed down. Does everybody see that? The edge that was from 1 to 4 in your, let's say your original graph looked like this. 1, 2, 3, 4. I had an edge here. Let's say I'm going to have an edge that goes like uh, this. OK? Let, let's say this is going to be my graph. OK? I'm going to make them both directed, both directions, so don't worry about that. OK? But what I'm going to say is from 1, I can go to 4, or I can go to 2. Does everybody now see that? And from 2, I can go to 1, or I could go to 3. Does everybody kind of see that? And from 1, I can go to 4, and from 4, I can go to 1. Do you see kind of what I'm doing? I'm drawing the vertices on one level, but now the edges are going to connect vertices of different levels, and all the arrows are going to go down. Now I'm going to do the exact same thing on the next level. One has to get connected to, I guess, uh, two and four on the next level. Two has to get connected to one and three on the next level. Four has to get connected to one on the next level. And I think that's it. Does everybody see what I'm doing? And see how I'm going to replicate that several times? Now here I've replicated it. That's one edge, two edge, three edges. What is, going, what is the shortest path from this vertex in this level to this vertex in this level? How many edges can it possibly have? It's got to have use one edge to get down to here, and one edge to get down to there, and one edge to get down to there. Does everybody see that? And it's got to go, if it's from here to here, it's going from something called 1 to something called 4. Isn't that right? So wouldn't the shortest path in this graph give us the shortest path the shortest path from here to here is going to be the shortest path of three edges from vertex 1 to vertex 3. How many people see that? Understand my graph construction here. OK? And do you see that if I do this, I can use a vanilla Dijkstra's algorithm to get exactly what I wanted. OK? Any questions about this? OK? If you think about it, this is actually, this is the kind of thing that I like to think about, OK? Don't design a new graph algorithm. Design a graph that will give you the answer that you want. It doesn't always work, OK? But quite often, if you think about it the right way, it will do that. Any questions about this construction or anything like that? Yeah? OK, so first of all, OK, so the question of which is easier, this or that, I will argue it's in the eye of the beholder, OK? And I will take a vote, as usually. Which do people do we think is, a be is easier? Is it to design the graph and use Dijkstra? Or is it to use that recursive thingy? Who here says that design the graph and use Dijkstra is easier? OK? Who here says that the, the, the recursive thingy is? OK, it looks like the recursive thingy is winning, but it's not unanimous, right? They're both different ways of thinking about it. What's nice about this is I didn't have to think about designing a new algorithm. I had to design a new graph, OK? Yes? OK, the moment you start modifying your graph, your algorithm, you realize you need a new proof of correctness. Isn't that clear? OK. And so what I'm saying is I can believe a world, maybe if you give me a modified algorithm and a, and a new proof of correctness, then we're in business. OK. 
What's interesting is I know Dijkstra's algorithm is going to work right, right? What this graph says is I've proven that any path from here to there is going to have exactly k edges in it, right? So therefore, the shortest algorithm that you find is going to have to be the shortest, the shortest path you find is going to have to be the shortest path on k edges, OK? Again, there's a difference in the behold. Both of these are perfectly reasonable ways to do it, OK? Any questions about it? And there may be other ways I don't completely understand. OK, yes? Is there any way to get, OK, so first of all, it's your modified algorithm. It's not my modified algorithm. So I don't feel I understand a modified algorithm. So if you're asking me as a, you know, trying to be fair, OK, I don't see in my head a way to modify Dijkstra's algorithm that I would see coming up with a clean proof of doing this, OK, in the way that I see the world trying to be a fair person, OK? And this is why, this is, these are the ways that I see the problem. Okay, there may be other ways of seeing it. It may be possible. Okay, but in general, these are the ways that I like to think about it. Any questions about it? Yes? Hey, do you ever, like in, in rare cases, trivially modify something? Or just do I ever modify? I have been known to modify a graph algorithm in my day. Okay, but what I will tell you is, in general, rec recognize that graph algorithms are very, very subtle. Go to the errata page of my book. And look, go, and look at where all the errors in my book are. Where are they in it? They're in my depth-first search application, uh, you know, implementation. Because depth-first search is very, very complicated. OK? So, so generally speaking, graph algorithms tend to be fairly subtle in their proofs of correctness. And that's why, I am, that's why I'm trying to tell you to not be so brave about saying, oh, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this path, and it's obviously going to give me the right thing. OK? Because generally speaking, that doesn't happen. Doesn't mean it can't happen. Doesn't mean there isn't a way to modify this algorithm possibly to make it work. But you need to be very, very precise about what you're stating, and you need to be precise about your correctness argument. Any questions? This may be even more editorializing than I, than I had intended to do. But any questions? OK. So OK. Again, what I think this is important of, this is, should be illustrative of two important things. One is it can be very powerful to design different algorithm graphs for the same algorithm, OK? And then it can make the algorithm do something different. That's a design idea. You may, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. The other is that this recursive idea of coming up with a recurrence and storing the answers so you don't have to recompute them is also a powerful idea, OK? Any questions about that? OK? Any questions about that? OK. OK. So what I'd like to do now is um, change the subject a little bit to um, sort of in the new thing. I want us to talk about backtracking. And um, the model for backtracking is Sudoku. How many people here are, have played Sudoku? OK, everybody. How many people still play Sudoku? Is Sudoku still interesting? OK, good. Um, so what is Sudoku? It is this, this puzzle where you've got um, a partially filled in set of numbers. And you have to fill them in in such a way that you, um, what you call it, that, that every row has a number from 1 to 9, every number from 1 to 9, every column has a number from 1 to 9, every one of these nine squares has a number from 1 to 9. OK? Any questions about that? And you know. How do you do it? Whoever who, who considers themselves a hot shot Sudoku person? Somebody. OK, yeah. OK, good. How do you do it? Personally, personally. You're saying what I think what you're saying here is you're looking for places where there is as much constraint as possible on the choices, right? In principle, for this spot over here, we could put down any number from 1 to 9, except you can't put a 4, you can't put a 6, you can't put a 1, you can't put a 2, you can't put a 3, and you can't put an 8. Does everybody see that? 
So what is it that you're thinking when you're doing Sudoku? You're looking for spots, generally speaking, at least, you know, I think in general, you're looking for spots that are as constrained as possible, right? And then, you know, then if you're like me, I guess you make a guess from one of the ones that are constrained and you see what happens. And hopefully there's a way to work it out. And if you made a bad guess, you go back and erase things and put the, in the right, the right, the right way, uh, the alternate number. Any questions about that? So what we're going to be doing in here is basically the algorithmic idea behind solving Sudoku problems, okay? Or basically this notion of backtracking. Sudoku, to a certain extent, is a form of exhaustive search where you're going to try to, you know, you could solve a Sudoku problem by writing in all possible pairs of no, patterns of numbers then cross out any board that, that, that has a repetition in the wrong place, right? Now that would be a very expensive thing. There's ungodly numbers of possible Sudoku configurations, right? Instead, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to put down numbers, fill it in, numbers as far as we think is a good idea, until we're stuck. There's no possible way to extend it. And then we're going to pull back, we're going to erase the last number we put in and see if we had any other choice. And potentially keep pulling back and trying other possibilities. Okay? And this is the idea behind backtracking, okay? which is going to be a general algorithm for doing exhaustive search okay, efficiently. Any questions? OK, good. So what is the idea behind backtracking? Okay, again, in some sense, um, okay. So backtracking is going to be built around trying to find solutions, where we're going to represent our solution as an array of things, okay, array of elements, or we'll call it a vector. Maybe I'll call it a solution vector. But basically, it's a one-dimensional array, where what I'm going to do is fill in my spots one by one, okay? And at each point in this thing, in my search, I am going to try to extend my solution by sticking another element in it, if that's possible. And if it's not possible to find a, a candidate to put into the next position, I'm going to delete the last element that I had put in and try to replace it with something else. Does everybody kind of get that idea? And if we think about it, one way that we could, let's think what, what we could mean. Some problems in our that we talk about in this class require permutations as answers. What is a permutation? Does anyone remember what a permutation is? Yeah? The number of permutations is the number of ways you can arrange something. A permutation is a way to arrange something, right? So a permutation of n things is a, an, an, an ordering of the numbers 1 through n in a distinct pattern, right? How could we represent a permutation? Well, let's say we want to start building a permutation. Maybe in the first slot, we'll put the number 5. Then in the second slot, we'll put the number 7. Then we'll put the number 2. Does everybody see how we can grow a permutation one spot at a time? Are there problems we've talked about in this class where permutations are the answer? When it, are there any problems we've had where permutations, arrangements, are answers? Yeah? <coughs> Sorting would be one algorithm problem. We could do something called incredibly slow sort, okay, which tries all possible permutations of the items and then tests whether it's sorted. Does everybody agree with that? That would be a correct algorithm for sorting, but would be a, you know, I, I'm not confident that that's a good way to do it. Okay, yeah? Finding a subset of numbers that adds up to a target, our knapsack thing, was a problem that searched through, in some sense, all subsets of n items. Does everybody agree with that? So we were looking for a problem where we wanted to construct subsets. The problem of you know, I've got a bunch of items with a certain weight. I want to find a subset that adds up to 796. Okay? I could iterate through all subsets. Okay? What problem involved iterating through all permutations here that we've talked about a little bit? Yeah? 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 Ye
Traveling salesman problem would be the classic problem where you know, there are any permutation as a possible order to visit the cities. We want to find the one that is of, of cheapest total cost. One way to do it was to iterate through all n factorial permutations and pick the best one. Any questions? So backtracking will give us a way to iterate through all possible of these steps. OK? Any questions? Now, again, as I've said actually a couple of different times, I'll show you the backtrack algorithm in a second. But basically, what's the idea? We have a current configuration. We're going to try to extend it by adding another element. After we extend it, maybe what we now have is the solution we want. It's a complete permutation of n things. OK, if so, we're happy and we do whatever we want to do with that thing. If not, we're going to want to look and say, is there a way to extend what we have so far even further so it is a solution? Make our permutation longer. If it is, we're going to make it longer and continue. If not, that means we made a mistake. And we're going to knock the last element off of our permutation and stick something else in there in the hopes that we'll be able to grow it right. Any questions? OK, I've said that several times. It's now maybe nebulous. Here is pseudocode for the backtrack algorithm. OK, what is it going to do? Backtrack A of k. The arguments are our solution vector A and an integer k, telling us how many spots in the array have we filled in already. OK? If what we have so far is a solution, that's great. Do whatever we came to get the solution for. Maybe we want to print it out. Maybe we want to send it to our cousin. Whatever we want to do, now we have a solution. If not, we want to see, maybe we can get a solution by making it bigger. We set bop k to k plus 1 and compute the set of possible candidates that there can be for the k plus, plus the now kth position, given the elements we have already put down. That's kind of the point. There's going to be a certain number of set of things we can do here that would represent legal extensions of A. Then what are we going to do? One by one, take a candidate from, from our set of candidates, stick it in the kth position here, and then search from this new larger configuration. Is it a solution? Can we extend it? OK. Maybe we will find the solution by having stuck this value on into it. If not, eventually this recursive call to backtrack will bomb out, and we will continue to iterate through other candidates at that position. Any questions about that? Any, yes? SK is the set of candidates, is the way I read it. While the set of candidates is not empty, pull one of them out of the candidates, delete it from the set of, re of remaining candidates. So we don't, we know we've already, we're going to try it. If it works, that's great. If it doesn't work, we, we, you know, that's it. It blew its chance. Any questions? OK. Any questions about this? OK. Does this algorithm look at all familiar? OK, let's look at this. Does this algorithm look familiar like anything that we've seen in here? OK, what? DFS. This is, in fact, nothing more than depth first search in disguise. OK, what is the disguise? So why is it depth first search? Suppose that instead of depth first search worked on a real graph. There's no real graph here. How can this be depth first search? Imagine a graph where the vertices of our graph are all possible configurations, partial, um, what you call it, partial solutions and solutions. What this is going to be doing, and you're going to be able to connect a partial solution to another solution by an edge if there's a way to extend it by one element to get there. Does everybody kind of see it? Then what we want to do is to walk over this entire graph of partial solutions in a way that we don't miss anything if it's there. 
Step by search doesn't miss a vertex if there's a way of reaching it, right? So really, what Backtrack is doing, OK, on a conceptual level, is just doing depth first search on an implicit graph of configurations. By implicit, I mean I haven't given you the adjacency list of it. But if you picture every, every distinct value of a and k represents a vertex, you can imagine that there's an edge between, directed edge from this one to this one. If by adding one element from here, I get to that configuration. Now I've got a graph, and what backtracking wants to do is to explore this graph in such a way that it never misses anything and never repeats. Okay, and that's exactly what we wanted from depth first search. Any questions? How many people see the depth first searchness of this a little bit? Okay, yeah, what's your question? Do we have to take order of consideration? Do we have to take order of elements? Well, how does depth first search take care of order of elements? Let's think about it. The order of elements that we explore when we go down an adjacency list is determined by how the vertices were ordered on the adjacency list, right? And likewise, the order in which we're going to process the next elements here depends upon whatever order the candidate generator put them in, right? So there's no more order here or not than there was before. We're starting from the case where our vector is empty, so k equals 0, right? That's where we're, going to, we're starting our depth first search from. And then we're going to explore everything that is reachable to it from it there. Any questions? OK. So if backtracking is depth first search, again, backtracking will be used to search through all possible subsets or permutations of a set. That's sort of the bread and butter application of, of backtracking. Backtracking is going to be correct for the same reason that depth first search is correct. If there is some configuration that is reachable, we're going to eventually reach it. OK? Backtracking is going to be reasonably efficient because the same reason that depth first search is reasonably efficient, it's not going to visit things more often than it has to. But there's going to be an extra component is that um, we're, going to pr we're going to make it even more efficient by making sure we don't visit parts of the graph that won't interest us. Okay? And that's where this whole idea of pruning is going to come in next class. Any questions? Okay, so let's get very, very concrete here. This is the backtracking algorithm, okay? This is actually an implementation in C of the backtracking algorithm, okay? Now, you are going to have to do for your homework four, as I'll talk about at the end of class, actually implement a backtracking solution to a problem. This is backtracking. What does it do? Okay, and this backtracking program can do anything if you instantiate it with the right calls. What is backtracking going to do? OK. OK, uh-oh, I'm losing power. OK. What is backtracking going to do? If my current solution vector A filled up to the first k solutions is a solution, then do something with it, right? Whatever you wanted to do with it in the first place. If not, k goes to k plus 1. Call a subroutine to construct what are the candidates for the now kth position, given a. OK, fill in the candidates over in this array c, and tell me how many of them there are. That's what this is really going to say. Then while there are candidates remaining I haven't looked at, copy the ith candidate into the kth spot. Backtrack from here to see if it will eventually lead to a solution. If not, it's going to come back here, and I'm going to try and replace it, the, the kth position with the next candidate until I succeed. Any questions about it? It should be, yes. Do I need a different algorithm for Sudoku versus Backtrack as traveling salesman? The answer is no. What I need is different special purpose subroutines 
for telling me what a solution is, telling me what to do with my solution once I have it, and generate the candidates for the next move. Right? K equals K plus 1 is extending my tour. Suppose I've got a graph here, ka-chunk, 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 right? This is my graph. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Suppose I give you this so far the tour, 1, 4, 5. We agree that an appropriate traveling salesman is 1, 5, 3, 4, 2, 1. Does everybody agree that that's a solution to the, uh, a, whether it's the minimum cost solution isn't clear, but does everybody see it's like a Hamiltonian cycle? It visits every vertex exactly once. And if I weigh the edges right, this is going to be the lowest cost traveling salesman tour, right? How would I build it? Well, midway through my search, maybe I've put down one, five, and three. I filled the first three spots of my, my grid, right? And what are my possible choices now that I'm at vertex three? I could go to two, I could go to four, I could go to five, but eh, I don't want to go to five because that would repeat it, right? My choices here would be two or four. Does everybody see that? So my claim here is I've got a partial configuration. I'm going to grow one step at a time. And when I finish growing it, I have a complete solution, right? What about Sudoku? Here's my Sudoku world, right? I've got different things here, right? Some of the numbers are there, some of them are blank. What are my solution vector going to be? Perhaps the first spot in my solution vector will be a hole that, that, that the number hasn't been put down yet. What are the choices that are possible for that hole? Anything that doesn't violate any of the constraints so far, right? Maybe I'll put a 4 in that spot, and a 3 in this spot, and a 2 in this spot, and now I've got another hole. What are the candidates for this spot? Anything that doesn't, that, that any number from 1 to 9 that hasn't been violated, or hasn't been used, or constrained out of it, right? So I claim Sudoku and the traveling salesman problem look very much the same here. Does everybody see how they look the same? Yes. For the traveling salesman problem, what I would, okay, let me go through what my, before, let me just go through to make sure uh, we're talking about the same thing. Let me talk to you about, I said that this is going to do any search problem. And it's got three, all you've got to do for your particular problem, be it traveling salesman or Sudoku, okay, is specify what these three routines are, okay, and those are going to be problem specific. Okay, let's look at these things. What is, is a solution do? It's a Boolean function. It returns true or false. Is the current solution vector a complete solution to something? Okay. If it was a Sudoku board, how would I know if, I, if, if, if what I have proposed so far, if I'm putting in numbers into my thing, how do I know if it's a Sudoku board solution? Yeah? It could be that anything I've put in has violated any of the constraints. What else do I have to check? That I filled in all the holes, right? If I haven't filled in all the holes, it's not a solution, right? So basically, this is going to be a routine to check. Is what I have done a complete solution? And in the case of Sudoku, it could be that what this routine is going to do is say, are all the numbers specified and check if they have violated no constraints? Or another thing is if I know that I never put anything in that ever violated a constraint. You see that the problem just reduces to checking whether or not it was, uh, it's all filled in. Okay? Any questions? Yeah. Uh, number one, this will have to be an ON, right? It may have to be ON or something like that, but that's fine. It's whatever it is. It has to check to see whether or not I have filled in all the holes. It depends what it is. If I had a counter, 
that said how many holes were left. I could tell whether it's been filled in in constant time, right? Are the number of holes equal to zero? Okay. Any questions about what this does? Now, the input here, there's a third argument I have called input. That's just any baggage I need to finish to, in order to tell whether I really have a solution. For example, with the Sudoku board, I need to know what the other numbers on the board were, right? Okay. And for the traveling salesman test, I need to make sure I, I have a copy of the graph to play with, okay? But this is whatever arguments I need. But the key point is it's true or false. Is it a complete solution? Construct candidates is where really the most of the work comes in, which is saying what are the possible choices for the kth position of my solution given whatever the input was and my first k choices. In the case of the Sudoku board, what is the situation? I had, okay, a Sudoku board that was originally filled in with some numbers. Some of them had numbers in them, right? I had my first k minus 1. That filled in a couple of other numbers. Now, if I want to know what are the candidates for the first open spot in my Sudoku board, it's going to be which numbers are there that don't violate any constraints so far. Does everybody see that? In my traveling salesman thing, what is the choice for the kth spot on my traveling salesman tour, given the graph and given the first k minus 1 choices? What can I do? It's going to be what are the outgoing edges from this vertex that go to vertices I haven't already had in my tour. Does everybody kind of see that? So this is an application-specific thing to generate what the candidates are for the next slot. Any questions? Yeah. I am not recasting anything, okay? I'm going to figure out what are the, is the space of solutions. In the case of a traveling salesman problem, the solution is a permutation. I am going to construct all permutations. And I am going to tell, basically, essentially, at least in, in, unless, unless, if I don't do any pruning, I am going to construct all permutations or all possible tours and then keep track of which is the one that is the smallest. And that's the one I will report. So let, so let me show you the last argument. Process solution is what do I do once I have a solution? OK, in your Sudoku board, what do you do once you have a solution? You presumably set it aside and start working on another puzzle, right? Now, that's why Sudoku is not so important on some level, right? You don't care about the solution once you have it. OK, in the traveling salesman problem, what are you going to do? Probably print it out for somebody. Probably, you know, maybe send your salesman out with instructions to do this. Does everybody agree that once you have an answer, there's something that you might want to do with it? OK, and that's what this is going to be, uh, what, what, what we're going to do with it. Any questions about it? Yes? It doesn't reduce exponential time problems to polynomial time because there's a reason why a problem is exponential time, OK? But what this does is it tells you how to do an exponential time solution for an exponential time problem. And if you're very, very clever about how your pruning is, you can get through surprisingly large problems, even though they are exponential. That's kind of where the magic is going to come here. The important thing is systematically, this gives you a way to systematically be sure you can find the best possible answer through brute force. Yes? At what point are, they deter are the candidates determined whether they are valid or not? They should be determined right when you build them. Again, th there's two different ways you could do something. One possibility is you try all possible numbers. What are the candidates for this Sudoku spot squad? One through nine. OK? And then at the end, fill in the board and then check to see if it's valid. Much better 
would be if you actually eliminate anything that is not going to lead to a valid solution. So you only put down the numbers in that Sudoku square as candidates that, that aren't already ruled out by something. Does everybody see that? So the right time, construct candidates is the right time to throw out anything that's going to lead to a non-solution. Alternately, you could say, um, you know, go to the very, very end and check correctness at the very, very end. But that means you've probably constructed a large number of things that are going to be duds and spent a lot of time constructing things that aren't going to lead you to a solution. Okay, any questions? Okay, any questions about backtracking? Let me give you a concrete example of, of backtracking. Let's take a look at the problem of how we would construct all possible subsets of n things. Okay? How many subsets are there of n items? Two to the n. Okay? What are the subsets of, um, what you call it? What are the subsets of three things? Let's say I want to look at all the subsets of one, one, two, and three. What are the subsets of one, two, and three? Okay, someone with a hand. Okay, yeah? Uh, one, two, and three. One, two. Two, three. One, three. Okay. So he constructed them. How many are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we got them, right? Okay. Now, he constructed them in a semi-systematic order. Okay. They, they clearly, it's systematic. They group by size. Does everybody see that? The number of elements? There's different orders in which you can construct them. And in fact, backtracking, depending upon the details of how you do it, might come up with different orders of it. But what are we going to use to represent a, uh, yes? There's other ways to do it. You, okay, you can say use the binary numbers from 1 to n. Okay. So another representation of subsets, which is actually what my backtracking is going to use here, is to say that for every, we could represent any subset, like let's say this one, by a sequence of trues and falses, of n trues and falses, that tells us where true means we're going to include that number in the subset, and false means we're not going to include that number in the subset. Does everybody see that? This says true means yes, include one. False means don't include two. True means include three. That means this particular subset. OK? Does everybody see that? So why don't we try to generate okay, um, all the subsets using this kind of an order to it? OK? I am going to represent my, my solution vector is going to be an array of n true or falses, right? And I want to construct all 2 to the n possible permu uh, orderings of these things in order to do it, OK? Any questions about that? So let's look at my code. Bunk. How will I tell whether my solution is complete? If I want to construct a subset of n things, I've got to have n true and falses. Does everybody see that? So if k is the same as my desired size of a permutation, do I, ha I have a solution? Does everybody see that? This is basically saying if k equals n, then true, otherwise false. What are my candidates for the ith position? In this case, if I want to construct all subsets, what are the possibility, possible choices for the ith position in, my, in my, my permutation, in my subset? Either I'm going to include the ith element or I'm not, right? So if I'm representing my solution as an array of trues and falses, candidate 1 will be true, candidate 2 is false, I've got two candidates for that, 
right? Any questions? What will I do with my solution? Well, maybe you want the thing printed out like this rather than as a bunch of trues and falses, right? So what did I do with my process solution? For i goes from 1 to k, or which in the case is n, if a sub i is true, print out a sub i. Okay, print out i. Okay? And does everybody see that that would print out 1, 3 for this particular example? Any questions about it? That is all you need to construct all permutations, all subsets, using the backtrack program. Let's look and see what it does. OK, let's go and actually try to execute the backtrack program as I've described it here, right? I'm going to have three slots, right? Originally, k is equal to what? I'm going to start k equal to 0, right? And I'm going to bop it up, k equals 1. What are my candidates for the first position here? I can have a true or a false. Does everybody see that? What am I going to do? I'm going to put down a true, and now call it, backtrack to go deeper, right? Now here, k is equal to 2. I guess k equals 1 here, k equals 2. What are my choices for this position? True or false? I'm going to put in a true. Does everybody see that? And now k goes to k plus 1, k equals 3. What are my choices for here? It's true or false? I'm going to put down a true and call backtrack again. And what does it know? Now k is equal to the size of the thing, of, of n, right? So I have found the solution. What am I going to print out? 1, 2, 3. Does everybody agree? Am I done? No, I'm going to backtrack and now try the next candidate for this position. Does everybody see that? And now again, every spot in my array is filled. So ding, 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 I have a solution. I want to process it. What do I print out? One, two. Okay. Now, what's my next candidate for this position? I don't have any, right? I bomb back to here. What's my next candidate for this? I can put a false here. Now I advance forward. What are my candidates for this position? True or false? Does everybody see that? Now I put in a true and ding, ding, ding. Right? Does everybody see that? What subset did I produce? One, three. Does everybody see that? OK. Now I finished with this. I replaced this with an F. I now have again a subset. Does everybody see it? Which one is this? One. Does everybody see that? OK. Now, what is my next candidate for this position? I don't have any more, right? I bomb out. What's my next candidate for this position? I don't have any more. What's my, oh good, I got a candidate here. This is a false, right? Once I put that down, what's my candidate for this? I've got a choice of a true or a false. I'm going to pick a true. Here again, I've got a candidate now. I have a choice of a true or a false. What am I going to put down? True. What subset have I created? Which subset have I created? Two, three. I'm now going to go and put in the next choice here. What subset have I created? Just two. I have no more choices from here, right? I'm going to go now, replace this with a false. And now I go back to here. What are my choices? It is a true or a false. Does everybody see that? If I put down a true, what subset did I just construct? Three. Does everybody see that's three? And if I go back and replace it with the other one, I get a false. What subset have I created? Empty set. Do I have any more choices for this position? 
No. Do I have any more choices for this position? No. Do I have any more choices for this position? No. And I bomb out of my recursion, and that's the end of it. Does everybody see how I have systematically constructed all subsets using this procedure? OK. Any questions about that? OK. And again, the key to using backtracking is basically to, to make sure you construct your candidates to, um, what do you want? It's constructing candidates. It is, uh, you, know, uh, you know, testing to see whether you've got a solution and then processing it. Any questions? And generally speaking, when you call it, you're backtracking starting at the zeroth position. OK? And then just call it. Any questions about that? Any questions how you generate all subsets? Yes? Where does the pruning happen? The pruning happens next week. OK? It doesn't happen yet. OK? Any questions about that? But if you really need to know, the pruning is being clever about how you select your candidates. Right? Again, the dumb Sudoku version would say, oh, yeah, let's put down the numbers. Any one of the numbers from 1 to 9 are possible here. The smart Sudoku person said, I'm going to only put down the ones that might lead to possible solutions, right? And eliminate the moves that wouldn't go any there. <clears throat> the really smart Sudoku person would try to find which square has the smallest number of choices to put down that one, try to fill that square in first, right? And that's the kind of idea where the, where, where the, the pruning comes in. But basically, that in, generally speaking, that involves being clever about how you choose what candidates are, which candidates you can rule out as not leading to a possible solution. Any questions? OK. So homework four, I'm going to tell you next class about how you build uh, all permutations. OK? And if you want to look ahead, you can do that. But um, the homework four problem is going to be to solve a particular famous graph algorithm problem that requires constructing all permutations of something. It is a problem called the bandwidth problem. The bandwidth problem takes a graph okay, on n vertices and m nodes, on n vertices and m edges, and orders the vertices on a line so that the distance between vertices, between, that edges are as short as possible. Or let's think about it this way. Here we've got a special graph that's just a path in the graph. There's no cycles. It's just a path. See, it goes from 1 to 8 to 2 to 7 to 3 to 5 to 4, 4, 4 to 5, right? If we order the vertices like this, one of these edges looks incredibly long. It's as long as it could possibly be. Does everybody see it? If, on the other hand, we permuted the vertices so they were in the exact order of the path, does everybody see that every edge here is of length only one? We're here, we've got one edge of length order, I think it's seven. OK? Any questions about that? Your problem is, I am going to give you an undirected graph. I'm going to ask you, find me an ordering of the vertices on the line such that the longest edge is as short as possible. <coughs> Clearly, this, in this light drawing, the longest edge is as short as possible, right? Can anybody give me an algorithm to find the, what is the minimum bandwidth permutation? OK, yes. Construct all permutations. Then count the length of each edge, right? Find for each permutation what was the longest edge. Output the one that had the shortest, longest edge. Does everybody see that? So if you know how to construct permutations, in principle, this problem is easy, right? But possibly very slow, OK? Your job here is going to be, given a graph, find me the permutation which gives the lowest bandwidth. Any questions about what the problem is? OK, yes? 
I'm going to give you a graph. I mean, every time, you know, I'm going to give you, you, you know, you, you have a general program that takes as input graphs and as output, outputs permutations of vertices that minimize the length of the longest edge. Okay? Any questions about that? Any questions about what this problem is? Okay? So, what is the point that's known about it? Some of you are going to come by and say, hey, look, I've got a great fast program. And this thing solves all the problems that you gave me in, in, in a few seconds. There's a technical term for programs that have that property. And the answer is going to be wrong. Okay? This is a problem that is known to be NP-complete. Okay? It's known that there is, you know, with, with certain weasel words I will clarify later. Okay? Basically, that there is no fast algorithm known for this problem. Okay? So, um, so, and in fact, in, even on trees, there's no fast algorithm known for this thing. So this is one that's hard in a, in a particularly interesting way. We agree that if you iterate through all n factorial permutations and compute the length of the longest edge, you've got an algorithm that's going to run in something like n factorial times m time. OK? And that's good enough. That's good enough for something. But I want you to try to push it as far as possible. OK? Any question? The goal of the assignment is that we're going to have to try to produce as good an algorithm in practice as we can. Wait, not so fast, OK? I just want to finish giving you the rules, and then we will talk about it. This is an assignment. Everyone's got to write their own program. So you can say, say hello to your partner, but, but you're writing a separate program from your partner. Any questions? OK? Um, make sure you understand what the bandwidth problem is. Because some people are going to have strange ideas of what I'm asking. If you don't understand what the problem is, you can't write a program to find it. Does everybody kind of get that principle? OK? Um, I have set up on my web page test um, files of different sizes. Start by running this, your program on the small size problems. Does everybody kind of get that idea? Because what's going to happen with your program is, you're going to run it on the smallest file, and you say, yeah, it finishes in a, in a second. You're going to run it on the next size program, and you're going to say, yeah, it, runs, it finishes in two seconds. You're going to run it on the next size file, and you say, hey, it doesn't finish at all. OK? <laughs> I've been waiting here for, for 10 minutes. Don't, your goal is not to stare at the computer for a long time. Start from small and keep going. Let me just finish dealing with this. Your program is going to be graded on what is the biggest problem it can solve in one minute. Does everybody kind of get that idea? So you don't get points for staring at it for long times. Okay? Your goal gets faster by getting your program sleek enough that it can do bigger and bigger instances. Yes? What are languages allowed? Okay. Languages are allowed or anything you want. Okay? What computer are you allowed to use? Anything you want. Why do I let you do this? Because it doesn't matter. OK? Anyway, we'll talk more about this next class. But look at the assignment and start playing with it. OK, thanks a lot.